Hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for first off clicking on this video. My name is Penilla. I'm a neuroscientist by training, meaning I know about the brain and I run a nonprofit organization called Mind Blossom. I recently gave a talk, an impact session talk at the NAMI convention 2024 in Colorado. And I got so many requests for sharing the slides that I decided just to create a video recorded presentation. If you are interested in getting the slides in the, I guess, hard paper format or email format, please let me know. We are more than happy to share them, but this will be an opportunity for you to actually see the entire presentation, even if you weren't able to participate. So let's get started. And the title of my presentation was Hope Anchored in Evidence empowering caregivers through mental health literacy. Now, as I kicked off this presentation, I began with asking the audience a few questions about themselves, and I would love for you to reflect on them as well and see where you might fit in. So the first one, how many of you are caregivers of someone with a mental illness? Now, the people in my audience, the majority of them raised their hands. A lot of caregivers came to this conversation. And the second question I asked them is, how many of you have experienced a mental illness either now or in the past? The majority raised their hands, and I'm guessing that you are probably doing that too. At least I know that 20% of the population will be doing that. Now, I then went on to introduce myself. So let me introduce myself to you. My name is Panilla. I recently got married, which is why my last name has changed depending on where you look for it. As I already mentioned in this video, I am a neuroscientist by training. I received my PhD from Emory University and I completed a short postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School. I am from Denmark, one of the happiest countries in the world, allegedly, and I moved to the US at age 21 in large part because of my education. Now, despite being from the happiest or one of the happiest countries in the world, I have a long personal history of serious mental illness. I won't have time to talk to you about that now, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about that. You, in fact, can also find more information about my background in various podcasts and articles that you can find on our website, mindblossom.org. What I am really happy to share with you is that I'm now recovered and I am the very proud founder and CEO of Mind Blossom. Mind Blossom is a nonprofit organization that provides free of cost mental health education to underserved communities. Our core mission is to provide people and communities with evidence based knowledge, effective communication skills, and meaningful support strategies. Now, as we dive into this talk, the first part of my title is caregivers. And so let's talk a little bit about what a caregiver is and what a better example than just talking about a specific person who is a caregiver. So I would like you to meet Patricia. Patricia is a mother of a 10 year old with generalized anxiety disorder. Her child's illness means that it can be really difficult to drop her off at school and she's often called to pick up her child early. Patricia is recently divorced. That means that she is now a single mother and the primary caregiver. Professionally, Patricia is a nursing assistant. She works at a local hospital. And while she, was, she used to work full-time, she recently moved to a part-time position. Patricia struggles. Patricia is exhausted and she can't help but feel shame and guilt about her child's condition. More recently, Patricia was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, the most common disability in the entire world. Now, how many of you know someone with a story similar to Patricia's? I know I do. A lot of people who support somebody with a mental illness finds that it's really, really tough. The research is demonstrating that 41% of caregivers supporting someone with a mental illness experience severe burden. And just like Patricia, 46% of these caregivers have signs of depression. 
and 60% of them experience negative emotions like anger, guilt, frustration, shame. 78% of caregivers supporting somebody with a mental illness report regular out-of-pocket costs. On average, research has shown that caregivers spend between seven to $9,000 every year on various costs that are associated with their loved one's mental illness. And these costs are the highest for people who are African-American, Hispanic, or in the younger generation. It's therefore perhaps not that surprising that 47% of caregivers report significant financial setbacks. These sorts of setbacks could be because you have to stop saving up for your retirement, because you have to drop out of school, or because you, just like Patricia, went from a full-time to a part-time position. Now, on top of all of this, 20% of caregivers have their own mental illness. And just as a cherry on top, caregivers supporting someone with a mental illness report reduced life expectancy. Caregiving for someone with a mental illness is really, really tough. Now, I want to go back to the financial setbacks because it's not just Patricia and caregivers that are losing out. Employers and the society at large really lose when caregivers go unsupported. Studies have found that each employer will lose between twenty dollars to $30,000 for each employee who's also a caregiver of somebody with a mental illness. The majority of these costs come from something called presentism. Presentism is when you're showing up at work, but you're not really there. Your mind is somewhere else. So for example, for Patricia, she will show up at work, but she's thinking about her child and she is wondering, oh, will I be called up early? Is my child okay? What about that bill? Did I pay it? Am I going to have enough money for the end of this month to pay for food, diapers, rent, who knows what? So to summarize, not only is caregiving psychologically really tough, it also represents a large financial strain. Now, the second part of my title is focused on mental health literacy. So let's define what that is. Mental health literacy involves understanding, recognizing, managing, and preventing mental health conditions. Mental health literacy is also known as mental health education, more colloquially, which is what we often call it at Mind Blossom, and psychoeducation in the scientific literature. Now there are four, ah, there are four major components of mental health literacy. The first is understanding how to achieve and maintain a good mental health. The second is understanding mental health disorders and their treatment. The third is decreasing stigma around mental illness. And the fourth is developing healthy and effective help seeking strategies. At Mind Blossom, we deduce this down to three action items. The first action item is to build evidence-based knowledge foundations around mental health and illness. The second action item is to develop effective communication strategies with various stakeholders ranging from your healthcare provider to your peer, to your loved one, to your colleagues. And then the last action item that we really focused on is developing resourcefulness and empowering people with the skills to know where to find good support. One of my favorite parts about mental health literacy is that it can be provided in so many different formats. By far, the most common way of receiving mental health literacy is in a one-on-one -on -one setting, whether that be through individual therapy or family-based therapy. But as we know, there are a ton of barriers for people in accessing these types of therapies, whether that be financial, insurance, logistics, or maybe stigma. Another really effective way of receiving mental health literacy is in a group-based format. In fact, it's been so effective delivering mental health literacy in a group-based format that various organizations, some of which are demonstrated here on the slides, are advocating for implementing mental health literacy into school curriculums. 
School curriculums and the school in general is one of the most prominent and common ways of people, putting people together in a big group. However, caregivers are often overlooked and people like Patricia are often excluded from current day mental health literacy programs. That is an enormous shame because we know that people like Patricia are struggling. And we also know from over half a century of research that these programs are really, really effective for caregivers supporting somebody who's mentally ill. We know that this effectiveness is demonstrated psychologically, socially, and financially. For this talk, I'm going to dive into why we should be investing more resources into implementing mental health literacy programs for caregivers supporting somebody with a mental illness all over the US. I'm first going to tell you about how and why mental health literacy works. Then I'm going to dive into an often very overlooked item, which is what a mental health literacy program for caregivers should look like. And then I'm going to talk about the barriers for implementation. And the biggest part of my talk will be focused on the ideas for solutions. And I've, of course, I'm not going to finish this presentation without a few calls to action. Okay, let's kick it off. So the first part is focusing on how and why mental health literacy works for caregivers. And we know from half a century of research that mental health literacy empowers caregivers with knowledge, skills, and confidence. When we dig into all of this research, we can find six very common statistical changes that caregivers identify after having participated in a mental health literacy program. The first improvement comes from their knowledge. We see that caregivers that have been a part of these programs are more knowledgeable about mental health and they also have less stigma around the topic of mental illness. The second aspect is that caregivers report improved confidence in communicating with healthcare providers, family members, teachers, their peers, their employer. And we also see that they're more effective when it comes to seeking help for their loved one and for themselves. This is something I'll get back to with a more concrete example later in the presentation. And importantly, we see that these caregivers report increased overall well-being after participating in this program, including or in addition to a reduction in their perceived burden of caregiving. And last but not least, we see that there is an improvement in the financial health of the caregivers that have participated in these programs. Now, as these positive effects start emerging in the caregivers as they are participating in this program, we also start seeing that their loved ones are improving. We see that their loved ones show reductions in their symptoms and improvements in their behaviors. Overall, that becomes a benefit to the entire society. And it's what I call a win-win-win situation. So to summarize, when caregivers participate in mental health literacy programs, we see that they report improved well-being, they report improved financial health, and their loved ones are reporting improved symptoms as well. So have I convinced you yet that this is worth spending your time on? I hope I have. Since I can't see you're nodding, I'm going to imagine that you are. Let's now dig into this very overlooked topic of what a good mental health literacy program for caregivers should look like based on science. When we are developing these sorts of programs, there are two major things that we really need to be mindful of. We need to think about the content and the logistics. Now, based on research, we know that the content in a mental health literacy program for caregivers should be tailored to the people that we're talking to. This means that we need to know who they are, where they live, what are the challenges that they are experiencing, and what are the needs that they have right now. In other words, mass distribution of mass produced material does not seem to make the cut here. Now with that said, 
there are various topics that many different groups of caregivers really seem to benefit from, including, but not limited to, the neuroscience of mental health, self-support strategies, communication strategies, resilience and stress, myth-busting, and personal stories. Now, when it comes to the logistics, research is also guiding us in the right direction. We know from various studies that mental health literacy programs can be delivered either in a virtual format or in person with only minor benefits of implementing it in person. While I prefer in-person activities, it's really good for improving access and reducing the barriers that a lot of people experience when they're trying to get mental health literacy program access. Now, something that's really important is that the groups of these caregivers are kept pretty small. A good ballpark is around 20 people that are participating in the caregiver mental health literacy group. And that's because we wanna make sure that people are sharing vulnerably and that they feel that it is safe and that it can be all confidential. Now, when it comes to the moderator or facilitator, we want to make sure that it's somebody who's trained in mental health literacy, but it doesn't have to be an expert. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist or a therapist, and by no means, it does not have to be a neuroscientist. What is important is that this individual has received some reputable training in delivering mental health literacy, and somebody, maybe a co-facilitator or the same facilitator, has to have lived experience with the topic at hand. That is really, really important. Now, mental health literacy studies typically run between two to 12 weeks with an average being around six weeks. In other words, we know that these programs have to happen regularly. Single workshops, whether one hour, two hours, or a full day, are just not going to be as effective. In fact, we don't even know if they're effective at all, other than having a short-term influence, maybe for a week. So it's really important that we make sure that we have the resources to implement these types of programs on a regular basis. And then the last thing, as a scientist, I have to say this, we wanna make sure that we are assessing the impacts of the program, the quality, how much people are liking it, what are the things that they're learning from it on a regular basis. Now, I know it might sound like I'm asking for a lot, but I am not reinventing the wheel here. In fact, please pause the video and simply Google education for dementia caregivers. When you do so, you are very likely to find programs that are very similar to what I just talked about. On the other hand, if you Google psychoeducation programs for caregivers supporting mentally ill, you might actually find some programs. However, most of these programs are going to be focused on caregivers that live in Africa, Southeast Asia, or the Middle East. For some reason, mental health literacy programs are just not really accessible to caregivers supporting somebody with a mental illness in the US. Why? That leads me to talk about the barriers. We have been digging in to all of the literature that talks about mental health literacy program implementation. And in doing so, we have identified six barriers that seem to be really problematic. The first barrier is not that surprising. And that is that caregivers just don't know about mental health literacy. They don't know what it is. And even if they know about it, they don't know the benefits. A second barrier is structural barriers. People might not have access, maybe because their insurance won't pay for it, or maybe because they don't know where to look for it. And then fear of stigma, which I'll give a more concrete example on soon. And logistical issues. Now, logistical issues could be that they can't travel those 30 minutes because they can't get there. Or maybe because they don't have stable internet access for an online program. And then we really should not overlook that caregivers are already struggling. Providing them with mental health literacy programs is a huge benefit for them but they are already stressed out. And now we're asking them to put another task on their weekly schedule. And then lastly, a little bit more shamefully, many people, especially Americans, are unwilling to invest their time or money into programs 
where they don't understand the full benefits. In fact, studies have shown that people in America are very unlikely to invest their time or money into anything unless they fully understand and can see the financial benefits. Now, let's look at these barriers from the perspective of Patricia. Patricia first didn't know about mental health literacy programs. When she did, the first barrier became a logistical issue. She found a program at the regional hospital. However, getting there was not an option. It would be a 30 minute drive, but she doesn't have a car and who is going to take care of her child while she's at this session? Now, Patricia is a resourceful woman and she found an online program instead. However, because mental health liter literacy programs are not covered by insurance, she would now have to pay for this out of pocket, adding to her already high expenses that she incurs every year because of her child's mental illness. And then the barrier of fear of stigma. Patricia is a recent single mother and she also recently went from a full-time to a part-time position. She is really worried that in combination with her own mental illness diagnosis, people are going to think that her participating in this mental health literacy program is a reflection that she is not good enough, that she can't take care of her child. She is worried somebody is gonna take her child away. And that is something that she is not very willing to risk, understandably so. Now, a group of people sat down with Patricia and they said, hey, first off, we'll cover your fee. You don't have to worry about paying for participating in this online program. And secondly, they said, this is going to be a really safe space, a few people. In fact, you're going to be building community. So once Patricia had those concerns out of her way, we all realized that there were still other barriers in place. One of them being the increased burden. Patricia is already stressed out. She's exhausted and she has so many things on her plate. Now we're asking her to spend an hour and a half or two hours every week for a long period of time without fully understanding what she's actually gonna get out of it. And then lastly, Patricia, just like any other American, is pretty unwilling to spend her time or money on something where she doesn't know what her incentives are or what her long-term outcomes are. So we have to give Patricia a really, really good reason for showing up to this mental health literacy program. Now, while Patricia is a hypothetical person, of course, she does represent a number of caregivers that we at Mind Blossom have talked to directly. We talked to them as a part of our program on eating disorders. Now, eating disorders are the, one of the leading and deadliest mental illnesses. And we developed this program specifically for caregivers and youth facing professionals, where we wanted to give them resources to learn more about what are eating disorders? How can we prevent them? How do we treat them? How do we talk to somebody with an eating disorder? We created this program to be entirely virtual and people could attend either live or in a pre-recorded fashion. This was really to optimize their ability to attend and make it incredibly flexible. We had a variety of speakers ranging from people with personal experiences to leading experts that are sharing insights you normally would have to wait months for and pay large buckets of money for in order to get that type of input. So it was a pretty good program. Of course, we followed the scientific evidence and kept the group small. We, we ran it weekly and we had regular assessments. Moreover, as a nonprofit, of course, we wanted to make it as cheap as possible. So we really ran it at the lowest cost possible. Now, if you have any personal or indirect experience with eating disorders, you can probably understand and appreciate how valuable a program like this could be. So what was the problem, you might ask? Well, no one really signed up. It's really important to mention that of the people that did sign up, they really enjoyed it and they have gone on to recommend it to all of their friends and peers and colleagues. In fact, if you want to sign up, you can do so right now by going to our uh, website, mindblossom.org um, 
eating, uh, navigating eating disorders course. There you can either sign up to pay for it or you can actually be a part of a research study. Anyways, that was just a little plug. Now, the fact that people don't sign up is actually a very common issue. We have come to understand that different companies that try to make this type of solution a product have failed. And so we were now failing too. Now, our first attempt at addressing this problem was to simply remove the cost and make it completely free. We did see an increase in the number of people that signed up and wanted to participate. However, not by as much as we thought. When we reached out to caregivers that expressed interest, but ultimately decided not to sign up, we came to realize that the challenge lied in the weekly commitment. People just don't want to sign up for something that happens on a regular basis. Now, we were really surprised by that because research studies for over half a century have demonstrated that mental health literacy groups work for caregivers when they happen on a weekly basis. What's so different about our program? Well, what we came to realize is that research studies will pay people to participate. And this is where we had a big realization. There is a huge disconnect between research studies and what works in real life. In research studies, people are paid to participate. In real life, we typically ask people to pay to participate. Knowing that Americans are very unwilling to spend their money or time on anything that doesn't have clear financial incentives, it made sense that they didn't sign up for our program. It did make sense too that Patricia would sign up for the research studies because that was a way to get free money that could help her stabilize her financial income. So we had to come up with some ideas for solutions. Together with my team, I asked myself, how do we implement mental health literacy programs for caregivers that work in real life? And we had various sources of inspiration. The first part of the solution had to do with getting people to sign up, but more so to show up on a regular basis. First, we were really inspired by these research programs that are paying people to participate. We thought maybe that's worth paying attention to. But really, the big kick and the big inspiration came from something that's happening over in the public health domain. Microfinancing programs happen all over the world, but mostly in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. These microfinancing programs are all about providing caregivers and households with a loan or money to stabilize their income or start a small business. However, getting that money and continuing to get that money is all contingent upon participating. Some more recent ingenious programs have required that in order to get the money, they need to participate in mental health literacy programs. Could we do the same in the US? Now, the last source of inspiration came from the direct cash transfer programs that have been happening in a few very um, progressive cities in the US. Some mayors there decided that they wanted to give out money to people that have a lower than average household income, and they were giving the money out for free. What's really cool and promising is that both from the microfinancing studies and also from the direct cash transfer projects, we are seeing that people are spending the money really wisely. They're spending them in things like paying their rent, paying off their bills, investing in their child's education or mental health. And they're doing so while participating in this program. Overall, we also see that as their financial health improves, their own overall well-being improves as well. Now, you're probably asking, wait, are you saying that we're supposed to be paying people to participate in these programs? Is that really a solution? And my answer is yes, we should be paying people to participate in these programs because we know from so much research now that financial health goes hand in hand with mental health. But we can do better than just giving people money. We can actually give them resources, skills, and knowledge so they can go out and address their challenges with resourcefulness and resilience. That of course is a radical shift 
in how we are addressing mental health. Now, the second part of our inspiration and solution had to come, had to do with finding an accessible and trusted location. We were really inspired by groups like an Anonymous Alcoholics, oh, Alcoholics Anonymous, excuse me, and similar peer-led groups that have been absolutely groundbreaking in destigmatizing mental illness and substance use disorder. They also have very convenient meeting locations and times. They're led by peers, they're free of cost, and they really do what we like to see them do, which is that they are fostering community. Now, our more favorite inspiration came from community centers. Community centers are spread out all over the US, mostly in under-resourced neighborhoods. And what they do is that they provide space. They provide space all over the US for their peers to gather. It's accessible, it's free of cost. And my favorite part is that it's full of staff that are undergoing or should be undergoing regular professional development. This is a perfect place for us to go in and actually provide mental health literacy training to the staff members such that they can run these mental health literacy programs for caregivers in their local community. These are not just my ideas or my, team, my, my team's ideas. Research for around a decade or more now have demonstrated the positive effects of mental health, or positive effects of peer support for our mental health. It has also demonstrated that when we train peers and non-experts in delivering mental health literacy, those programs are really effective. We truly do not need to have some sort of expert leading it. So our solution became twofold. One, we need to pay participants to be a part of these programs, contingent upon the fact that they are participating. And second, we need to host this program at the local community center where it's led by trusted peers. Now, for someone like Patricia, the monthly stipend was immediately very interesting to her because that gave her a financial incentive to participate and she could pay off her bills every month or invest in other things that she wanted to do, but as far as now, couldn't have. Patricia was also immediately compelled by the idea of going to the community center. The community center was walking distance away. She knows the people that attend there. She knows the people that were gonna run the program and even better, she knew that she could access trusted childcare right there during the sessions. Now, this twofold solution is a little bit progressive, I've been told. And a lot of people are asking, including myself, is this a cost-effective solution or are we just throwing money away? And the answer is yes, it is cost-effective. Studies since 2009 have actually demonstrated that it can not just be cost-effective, but over time cost-saving. And how is that? Well, the first part of it has to do with the indirect effects of caregivers participating in these programs. What we see is that once caregivers are participating in these programs, the medication adherence goes up in their loved ones. Their loved ones start taking their drugs or medication at the right time and at the right dosage, in part because their caregivers are now telling them to do it and holding them accountable. We also see that the caregivers are enrolling their loved ones in more effective treatment strategies. In fact, one study demonstrated that comparing two groups of parents, showing them either effective treatments over a pamphlet or a website compared to a virtual or in-person mental health literacy group, the parents that participated in the mental health literacy groups were much more likely to enroll their children in evidence-based and effective treatments for their children. Now, when we start improving our medication adherence and we also start improving the types of treatments that we enroll our loved ones into, it makes sense that we start seeing these improvement in symptoms. And that's in fact what studies are reporting. So that when caregivers are being a part of these programs, we start seeing, as I already mentioned, that their loved ones show reductions in symptoms and also improvement in their behaviors. When we start seeing these changes, 
we also start seeing reductions in their relapses, maybe reductions in their panic attacks, in their manic episodes, in their psychotic episodes, or maybe just their behavioral outbursts. And over time, and overall, this means that we also reduce their hospitalization rate. Now, some other savings opportunities that were not referenced in this particular study I'm talking about here have to do with the caregiver's income. Because the caregiver is now more able to show up at work, they will have reduced unpaid time off, and they also will be more productive. These are two giant losses, uh, financial losses for employers overall. So to summarize it, when we are spending money on mental health literacy programs for caregivers, we save more than we spend. And this is true, not just at the individual, but at the societal level as well. Now, I wanna walk you through an example program. And this program is designed specifically to be for mothers in a local community that are underserved. These underserved mothers have a lower than average income, and they're going to participate for 12 weeks in this program. We're gonna just include 10 people for now uh, because you know money and also wanna make it more uh, exclusive and make sure that they can build long lasting bonds. And of course, we're gonna make it a part of a research program and also give them that monthly stipend that I just advertised. So let's break down the costs. What does it actually cost to run a program like this? This is a little bit messy. Let's break down the costs together. First, we have the moderator. Let's say that that moderator is getting paid similar to a social worker, and that in addition to those weekly sessions, we also have some training that they need to do on a regular basis. They have travel costs, and uh, they have some other logistical work. So let's say they get $2,500 in total for, being, for leading this program as a moderator. And then we also have the content developer. Let's say, based on what's published online right now, that they get paid $50 an hour, and in total, that's gonna come out to around $2,000. And then we need the researcher. Researchers are a little bit more expensive. They also take more time. So let's just assume that they come out to a salary of around $5,000 in total. And then we have the participant stipend, which is gonna be by far the biggest investments. We're going to give the, month, the mothers $500 a month for, particip for participating. And let's just add in another $200 for each mother for any additional types of surveys we're asking them to do. In total, that will come out to $1,700 per mother, which is $17,000 when you time it by 10. And then lastly, we have the location. But luckily for us, because we are hosting all of this at the local community center, we don't have to pay for space. So we are actually going to save a good deal of money compared to other types of organizations that aren't having this strategy. And so the total cost is going to be just under $27,000. And my favorite part is that 64% of those costs are gonna go directly to these 10 mothers that are living in an underserved community. Now, let's take a look at the savings potential. We can look at the savings potential from two perspectives. One, the individual perspective, like Patricia's, which is what we're gonna be starting with. And then second, from the employer's or the society's perspective, which is what we'll do second. So Patricia, let's assume that she can save up to 50% of her out-of-pocket costs by participating in these programs. Those out-of-pocket costs reductions could be about identifying the medication that is effective and the one that isn't so that she can cut out the ones that aren't. It might also be that she's finding new effective ways of approaching her child and supporting her child where she doesn't need some of the medications. Because Patricia is Hispanic, she's slated to spend $9,000 every year on out-of-pocket expenses that have to do with her child's mental illness. So that means that she could save around $4,500 every year. Now let's also assume that Patricia is now able to return to a full-time position after having completed this course. Maybe she is put in touch with another school that provides better support for children with mental illness. 
or she finds therapies that are more effective. This means that Patricia can now go back to work and as a nursing assistant, she is probably going to save somewhere around $18,000. So in total, this means that Patricia will save over $22,000 every year by being a part of this program. But it's not just Patricia who is saving some money here. The local hospital where she's working are also benefiting because Patricia is now better able to show up at work. She is more productive and she's also going to be less absent. So let's make the assumption that we're going to see an 80% reduction in Patricia's presentism and also in her absences, meaning that she'll have less unpaid time off. She'll be able to come to work on time and also only leave whenever she uh, is done with work and not when she's being called by the school. Studies have estimated that that sort of saving will come to be around $20,000 every year. So in total, this means that Patricia and the hospital can save over $42,000 simply by being a part of this program with a net profit of $16,000 almost. But it's not just Patricia who is benefiting. There are nine other mothers in a similar position that are also benefiting from this program. Let's make the little bit conservative assumption that 50% of these mothers are going to experience a 50% reduction in their out-of-pocket costs, and the other 50% are now able to return to a full-time position. When we add all of those savings opportunities together, that comes out to be around $110,000. Let's just for fun and simplicity say that all of these women work at the local hospital as nursing assistants, and that all of them now are able to show up in a better and more present way. And this means that the hospital will save around $20,000 for each mother. That comes out to $200,000 that they'll save every year. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, sure, you're being very liberal in giving out these savings opportunities. And you're right, I'm making estimations. But there are several other savings opportunities that I have not even included. For example, the mothers are now getting stipend earnings. We haven't looked at them as a savings opportunity. We also know that there are going to be reduced healthcare costs for their child and frankly, for themselves too, for the caregivers. We also know that statistically, their children are now, are now more likely to have a higher level of education attainment. And something that I haven't even touched on is the fact that these women are building a social network with each other. That is something that's very difficult to put a price point on, but we know that that is going to change both short-term and long-term health outcomes for these mothers and their children. So let's go back to this idea that we have two savings opportunities from the caregivers and the employers. When we add all of that together, it becomes $310,000 every year. And if we remove the costs, that leaves us with a net profit of over $280,000. If you are still really pessimistic, just please grant me the opportunity to assume that at least one mother will benefit from this program. Even so, we have still earned almost $16,000. And just a reminder, it's not just me who's making up these calculations and assumptions. Research studies have demonstrated that mental health literacy programs for caregivers are cost effective. So let me recap through the example of which I went in to mental health literacy. When I started Mind Blossom, I had spent a lot of time investigating how these, pro these programs work. How does mental health literacy really benefit caregivers? And while there are many benefits, as we have discussed, there were three that really stood out to me. First, the increased well-being among the caregivers. Second, the improvements in their financial health. And thirdly, that their loved ones are actually starting to do better. Once I started Mind Blossom, I really started rethinking how we're doing these types of programs. I wanted to do them right. I wanted to do them in a way that was based on science. And there were four major components that stood out to me. First, they had to be 
delivering group-specific content. It couldn't just be mass-produced material. And it had to happen regularly. We had to talk to these people on a weekly basis so that all of this work can be consolidated in their brain. And then we should have a peer and a non-expert lead these, but we should make sure that they are receiving appropriate training. And lastly, it's so important that one of the facilitators at least have personal experience with the topic at hand. Now, even though we follow this formula of developing these mental health literacy programs, we weren't immediately successful. And the barriers we experienced had a lot to do with getting people to show up regularly. And there are so many reasons why people don't show up, including but not limited to not having time, not being interested in spending their time on it, not wanting to pay for it, fear of stigma. While some of these challenges and barriers have to do with lack of awareness and maybe some stigma, some of them had to do with clear logistical things like money and time. And so we had to come up with some ingenious solution of how to address that. And we created a twofold solution. First, we wanna pay people to participate. And second, we wanna host it at the local community center. These are the ways that we have envisioned and currently are conducting these mental health literacy programs so that we can support people like Patricia. And by the way, these programs are not hypothetical. That maternal health program I mentioned, that is actually a program we're rolling out in New Haven this fall in 2024. The community we're gonna be in is called Dixwell. And there, we know that the median household income is $40,000 on, just as a comparison, it's $75,000 on average across the US. So these are people that don't have that much money. 50% of people in that community are black and 13% are Hispanic. 25% of the people living there are families. A survey from 2014 conducted by Yale found that the mothers living in that specific community, Dixwell, were struggling. 50% and more reported that every month they run out of diapers and food. These were also mothers that were reporting high levels of mental health concerns that were unmet. So we are hoping to really make a difference in these underserved communities by implementing these more progressive and new ways of bringing in mental health literacy in their community. And now, of course, I'm gonna finish it all up with a call to action. The first thing, if you're still here, please spread the word. Talk to the people in your neighborhood, your peers, your teacher, your mayor, any politician you can get a hold of. Tell them about how mental health literacy helps caregivers and really is a financial benefit to the entire society. The more we can do that, the more we can help people like Patricia. And second, I really implore you to support real life programs. Research is crucial. Mind me, I've been a neuroscientist for many, many years and I spent over a decade in academic research, but we need to start studying the real impacts of real life implementation of these programs. We need to make sure that they actually work, not just in a research context, but in a community context. So if you have any times, facilities or skills, please reach out to us or another organization that's doing similar work. And lastly, if you're one of those people that don't really have the time, skills, or facilities to provide us with, and you wanna just give us money, we highly appreciate it. And we would, again, implore you to provide that donation to organizations that are implementing real life programs, whether it's us or some other organization. And with that, I'd really like to thank my team there are so many people that have been involved with Mind Blossom. There is no way I can thank all of them, but three of the people on our team have been directly involved with the work that I'm talking about here. And these include Sushma, our current director of programming, Ava, and Justin. I'd also like to thank our advisors and collaborators. In particular, I'd like to thank Matthew Ridley. He's an economist over at Warwick University in the UK, and he's instrumental in enabling us with the skills to actually ask and address 
how people benefit from these programs financially as well as psychologically. And then of course, thank you so much for listening to me today. Really appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more about Mind Blossom, you can go to our website. Please, you know, find us, uh, find and follow us on, on various social media accounts. And also feel free to just send us an email. We are pretty quick at getting back to you. And if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, I highly recommend that you drop them in the comments. We'll make sure to get back to you. Thank you so much for being here today.